Hi, I'm Marty West, Executive Editor at Education Next, and I'm here today with our Editor-in-Chief, Paul Peterson, uh, who's also the author of a article in the winter 2011 issue of Education Next uh, that tries to look at the performance of American students in math and put it in global perspective. Uh, Paul, can you tell us what you found? Well, the most important finding is we found that uh, when it comes to the uh, education of the very highest performing students, uh, the United States comes 31st in the world. Uh, we educate uh, 6 percent of our students to this high level of accomplishment that's called advance on the National Assessment of Education Progress, and uh, th 30 other countries actually have a higher percentage than that. So, so you're looking at what share of students uh, perform at the advanced level in the National Assessment of Educational Progress. Why is this a good uh, benchmark to use uh, for this comparison? Well, it's one that people have uh, settled upon, and, and there's an international test called the TIMS test, which also uses the ex exact same level and the 6% of the U.S. On the, on the advanced level of that as well. And so uh, that's sort of what people have said is what you really should be if you're really a high performer in, in math. And so we looked and found out that actually in Taiwan, 28% of the students are at level. And in uh, three countries, including Finland, there are 20 percent, and, and, and I think about 15 countries, I've forgotten the exact number, there's twice as many as the United States, 12 percentage points or more, are at this uh, very high level. So, so we already knew from the NAEP how many, of Amer how many American students were performing at this level. So what you're doing in this report is trying to figure out how other countries are doing against this benchmark. How do you make that comparison? That sounds like uh, something that would be tough to do. Well, uh, there are... Uh, two tests that we are able to uh, bring together. One is the uh, PISA test, which is this international test, which is sponsored by the Organization for Economic uh, Co Cooperation and Development. Uh, and that's been a, a test that they have used that test now for uh, several times on uh, about 57 countries around the world. And so we used the latest available test, which is 2006, and we linked it uh, to the 2005 test on the NAEP because uh, the students are eighth graders uh, when they're uh, taking the NAEP and they're in ninth grade, a lot of them, maybe some of them are in 10th grade. Uh, when they take the PISA. So, so these were ninth graders in 2006, six. and so it's the graduating class of 2009? That's that right. Correct? The, okay. the graduating class of, two, how well did the graduating class of 2009 do in the United States? And then we look at each individual state too. So we can tell yeah. you that California, I think is about four and a half percent, and they're, uh, and they're way outdistanced by many, many other countries. No, so, so the answer for the nation as a whole is not very well, but what about some states? Aren't there some states that are up near the top of the league tables uh, if we put them in an international well, context? Well, actually, a lot of people think Massachusetts is doing uh, as good a job as any place in the world, and there's actually an article out in the Atlantic Monthly on our report that uh, just came out, and uh, they are treating Massachusetts as doing very well, but if you look at the facts very closely, uh, there's still 14 other countries that are outperforming the United States. Uh, outperforming the state of Massachusetts. So now, now, what about the issue of diversity? Uh, oftentimes when these international comparisons are made, uh, people highlight the fact that the U.S. has a more diverse, in some cases more disadvantaged student population, uh, and that that may be one of the factors explaining our failure to have as many kids performing at high levels. One of the things that people don't realize is that every country has disadvantaged well, sure. students, right? And so uh, you can't sort of escape uh, having disadvantaged students. Uh, but there by, are some countries by... that are significantly more homogenous than Ours and, yeah, yeah, perhaps. So what we did do in that regard is we looked only at the white students in the United States. You, there's a diversity there as well, but less so than when you include minorities. And so if you look just at the white students in the United States, you find that 8% uh, mm -hmm. are performing at the highest level, only 8%. And that's uh, they're outperformed by, I think, 28 other countries in that respect. I forgot the exact number, but it's somewhere in the very high 20s. And then, uh, then we also looked at just those who came from college-educated uh, parents. Well, it's hard to call them disadvantaged students. So if they have at least one parent in the family who has a college degree, 10% uh, of those are performing at the highest level, but only 10%. Well, that, if you look at uh, 15, 16 other countries in the world, and you look at all of the students in the US, not just those with a college degree, 
you've got uh, 12% or more. So uh, even if we compare college-educated, uh, students from college-educated parents uh, in the United States to all students internationally, it doesn't change the picture yeah, too so, dramatically. So I think some of the uh, thinking of this is there's only certain parts of the country, maybe the South, uh, where you have low-performing students, or there's only certain types of students that are low-performing, or we have to really uh, pay attention to the disadvantaged students because that's where the real problem is. But I think what we are trying to stress in this report is that even the very best schools in the country and in the in the students from the families where you would think that they would be able to perform at the highest level you're really not performing at the at a, at a world level so what should policymakers take away from this have they been too obsessed with closing achievement gaps at the bottom and not enough uh, uh focused on uh raising performance at the top of the uh, achievement distribution well we find absolutely no evidence that no child left behind uh, can be blamed for this in fact uh things have gotten better since the passage of no child left behind even for the highest performing students in math so you can't sort of say okay it's no child left behind let's get rid of it it all, all will be well, and all the problems are much deeper than that. So I, I think schools just up and down the line have to uh, really expect more of students and challenge them and bring them up to the highest level. And I think our, our math instruction is particularly uh, underdeveloped because uh, if you have math skills, you're you're a extraordinarily valued member mm -hmm. of the uh, society and of the economy. And so, if you have math skills, and this is another reason why we're looking at math, if you have math skills, uh, you have so many options out there that going into teaching is not going to be one of them unless we change the way in which we pay math teachers. Mm -hmm. Math teachers probably should be paid considerably more than other teachers because only in that way are you going to bring high level people into the teaching profession in this in this subject area. So you think this is really a math story primarily or is it uh, more broad than that? Well, it is especially in math. We have some data in our ta in uh, our appendices on science and reading and the situation is not as extreme there, mm. uh, but it's not a happy story there. It's uh, the United States is still trailing many, many other countries in the world in, in, in math and literacy. Uh, so it's not strictly a math story, but the math problem is by far the most serious one. Well, thanks, Paul, for uh, your work here, and uh, thanks for taking the time for sh to share it with us today. Thank you, Marty.